Hello and welcome to episode two of the Markets Politics Podcast. I'm Matthew Shaddock. I am joined, as always, by Patrick Flynn this week. Uh, and in this episode, we'll be discussing Liz Truss's first few hours, days as Prime Minister, what the betting market's reaction to that has been, rounding up a few of the other political betting movers around the world, and we'll have a brief chat about Sunday's Swedish general election. Patrick, brand new cabinet. We had some markets on who take the top jobs. Any big surprises there? No, nope, no surprises at all. Um, the market's got these spot on. Uh, Quasi Quateng, uh, Suella Bravman and James Cleverly were all very heavy favourites to take the jobs that they did. Um, interestingly, my outside tip for next Tory leader, Ranil Jayawardena, did take a role in the cabinet as environment secretary. So that's worth keeping an eye on, I think. Still available at 66 to 1 with some inferior betting yes. houses, I believe. <laughs> Probably worth a bet. Um, we've actually released some prices on who will be the first cabinet minister to leave the cabinet. Um, I won't get too involved into, the, into all the odds there, but interesting, Liz, Liz Truss, early favourite to be first person out of the cabinet. And the big thing today, the day of recording, we're going to hear the details of the energy price plan. They've all been fairly widely leaked, I guess, so we won't go into too many details there. But is that likely to be a vote winning, prove the Tories' chances at the general election? I mean, I'm a little bit conflicted on this. Um, I think in terms of support, you can expect the general public to be broadly supportive of the plans if they are what's being touted. Um, you can maybe imagine the Tories will get some sort of honeymoon in the polls from this, um, but I think it's important to put it into context. Um, looking at the latest polls, around a third of Labour's lead is coming from 2019 Tory voters saying that they are undecided. Um, if some of those come back into the fold for the Tories, like Labour's lead might shrink, but the actual number of switches from the Tories to Labour might not change. So it might not really be any kind of like real change. Um, but I think the task for Labour is to draw the distinction between their plan and the government's in terms of in terms of who pays. So that kind of question of fairness of whether it's fair for energy companies who are making hundreds of billions of pounds in profits over the next couple of years won't have to pay anything because the government is refusing to implement a windfall tax. Um, there is massive public support for windfall tax, including among Tory voters. Um, so I think, interestingly, like Liz Truss's style compared to Boris Johnson's and the fact that she's willing to take the fight to Labour directly on the argument rather than just delivering, you know, bluster and bombast that we've been yeah. accustomed to over the last few years. Though it might impress commentators watching PMQs, it could actually be quite helpful for Labour when it comes to highlighting the distinctions between the Tory policy and the Labour policy. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I thought she did quite well at PMQs, but as lots of other people have pointed out, uh, there have been plenty of examples in the past where leaders have done well at PMQs, but the general public... Um, Perhaps doesn't care very much about that. Well, I mean, let's just talk about, we've got a market on how long trust will last as Prime Minister. Um, what the early betting saying about that? Yeah, there's currently a 23% chance that trust will go by the end of next year. So that's a pretty short timeline. 40% um, says she goes in 2024 and just a 36% chance that she makes it to 2025. Um, so yeah, it, it's expected to be quite a short-term premiership for Liz Truss if the market's to be believed. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, she starts in quite a weak position compared to some other leaders who've taken over. She didn't get... I mean, the first round of voting of the Tory MPs, I think she got about one in six of them to support her. So that's a sort of base level of support against everyone else they could have picked. Um, and even by the end of the process, she was only getting around a third of people voting for her in that final round. Um, so I suppose there is some danger that her support in the parliamentary party is a little bit soft. Yeah. You, yeah. I think that's definitely a risk. Um, the fact that she doesn't have a kind of core base of core base of MPs. Um, I was just looking back and the two other leaders with the lowest support from their parliamentary parties were Ian Duncan Smith, who has gone within two years and Jeremy Corbyn, who, while he had a lot of support among Labour members, if Labour had the same system as the Tories, he would have been gone within 12 months because of that vote of no confidence that took place in, in 2016. Yeah, I mean, one other thing just to point out here is you've got to check the rules on this market. Yeah. Our market is, if I'm right, when she is replaced as Prime Minister, that could make a difference compared to some other places where they bet on when she's replaced as Tory leader. That was a big, there was a big sort of screw up in the betting markets when Theresa May resigned about this. Just, just explain 
how that works? Um, yeah, so the smart kids market relates to when Listros is replaced as prime minister. On some platforms, they have markets on when she's replaced as conservative leader. And there's a crucial difference. If there's an, say there's an election held in October or later of whichever year it takes place and trust loses and answers her resignation, we could get Prime Minister Starmer within a matter of days. Whereas in terms of replacing the conservative leader, trust may remain conservative leader until a new leader is elected. So she could actually leave the year after the next Yeah, month. I mean, this is a bit niche uh, rules talk, I guess, but it's kind of interesting. I mean, I'm surprised that some of these other betting uh, providers are betting on the the party leader metric, because as I said, when May left, there was a lot of confusion about, well, is she still Tory leader? Because she'd said she was an interim leader, whereas the position of prime minister could be some ambiguity. I mean, there's a few possibilities that that could happen, but it's a bit more clear cut. So I think I prefer prefer her rules, but I guess I would just say that. Um, what about sort of um, past leaders, how long they've lasted? Boris Johnson, what were the market saying about him when he took over? Yeah, I was looking back at this, actually. Um, and it seems like these kind of markets tend to underestimate the amount of time various leaders spend in office, um, I think, for a couple of reasons. So, yeah, just looking back to Boris Johnson in, in 2019, after two weeks in office, the market rated him a 45% chance to depart by the end of the following year. So that would be by the end of 2020. Even looking stateside four months into Trump's presidency, he was given a 42% chance of going within 18 months, despite the huge difficulties when it comes to getting rid of a sitting president in the middle of their term. Um, I think there's a couple of reasons for this. Like, obviously, the media loves to overstate the amount of danger a particular leader is in because it generates clicks and views. But I think the bigger reason is just the dynamics of who's trading on the market. Um, People who think a leader is going to depart in the short term are far more incentivized to start trading on that particular market than ones that think it's not going to settle for three, four years. Yeah, yeah. Um, so kind of putting their money down is going to be a long-term investment. Um, I mean, of course, those people can lay the short-term contracts, but obviously requires more investment to get the same level of profit. Yeah, the Trump price was crazy. If you just looked at the base rate of how likely it was that president would be leaving before the end of his first term, and you could get evens. Yeah, actually, you could have got evens, I think, at points that he would even last four years. Um, nice bet for some people. Um, this market's actually, this is a really good market. We've got a market on when the Tories will next get a poll lead. That's been running for quite a few months now. Um, currently, it's about a 60% chance that the Tories won't get a poll lead at any point in 2022. They haven't led in a single poll this year. And the market is saying that that will probably carry on until the end of the year. Which side of the bet do you think you'd like to be on there? I would take the 60% um you think they won't they probably yeah, won't no, be a break i can't see it um i mean yeah opinion is is the pollster that's showing the lowest lead for labor at the moment but opinion's methodology is different their uh poll to poll change is a lot less bouncy um so i think just looking at oh there are only four labor's only four points ahead with one poll and thinking that you might get an outlier tory lead isn't necessarily going to be the case because opinion are quite stable in terms of their their labor leads um, I think Labour's lead could potentially go down, but whether the Tories get a lead, I'm not convinced. Yeah, I mean, I've seen a few polling experts on Twitter saying there's a pretty good chance Labour, uh, that sorry, the Tories will get a lead at some point, maybe pretty soon. In fact, one of those, Kieran Pedley from Ipsos Mori, will be joining us on the show next week. Um, not too many changes in the betting markets on the next general election. I suppose you wouldn't really expect any because everyone had priced in that Liz Truss was going to win this. Um, a lot of pundits had been speculating about Truss calling a snap 2022 general election. What are the price is saying about that? So, yeah, it, it's gone down. Um, so if you recall last week, we said there was about a 7% chance. That's now gone down to a 3% chance in the last week. Um, not looking very likely. No, I mean, and the, 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 the market on who's going to win most seats at the general election, absolutely level at the moment, 50-50. I mean, I think I said last week I had a small bet on the, on Labour to, to win this. If you had a free bet, £300, Patrick, which way would you would you go on that one? Labour. He's hesitating. Just, just. <laughs> yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see how that all goes and the, the, you know, the initial reaction to trust his uh, premiership could change those prices quite a bit. I mean, if you were anticipating some kind of trust boost with the energy price plan, then maybe you think about backing the Tories and hoping they 
go up a little bit and then cashing out for a small profit. I don't know. Um, OK, let's just leave the UK for a minute. We have a big European election on Sunday. You wouldn't know it perhaps following the UK media, but Sweden having a general election this Sunday. Um, balance of power appears to be on a knife edge. I mean, you know, neither of us are Swedish experts here, but what we can say is that it's overwhelmingly likely that the incumbent Social Democrats will win the most seats. They're quite a long way ahead in the polls. Betting is sort of 1.01, 99% chance they'll be the biggest party. But not completely straightforward about whether they'll still be in power after the election. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, in terms of most seats, it's it's really clear. Like, Social Democrats are the overwhelming favourites. I mean, unsurprising. They've been the largest party in every general election since 1917. Um, though in terms of the potential party coalitions, the left bloc and the right bloc, the polls are pretty much neck and neck. Um, but interestingly, the incumbent Magdalena Andersson is a fairly comfortable favourite with a 69% chance of remaining PM after the election. So that that's kind of an interesting yeah. disparity. Yeah, she is. I mean, she herself is very popular. I yeah. mean, her approval ratings are huge. I think the, the way Sweden uh, has dealt with the accession to NATO, I think has been quite popular. Um, the other plausible option as leader is uh, Ulf Christensen, who's leader of the Moderate Party, who are the main party of the centre-right and is most likely to be the, the candidate who will be Prime Minister if that coalition comes to power. Actually, from a betting point of view, there's quite a big difference here. Smarkets have got Christensen at 3.8 at the moment, uh, ending up as Prime Minister after this election. Whereas there's only 2.5 with some other betting platforms. Now, I don't claim to know which of those prices is right, but when there's a big discrepancy like that, there's probably a bit of value about so anybody who wants to keep an eye on the last minute polls might be able to get a bit of value there. I mean, the other thing that you can bet on in this election is how the Swedish Democrats will do. They're the sort of far right party been surging in the polls, probably going to finish second, around 20 percent of the vote. Um, but there's no real prospect of their leader becoming PM, I don't think, because the other parties, even on the right, would much prefer not to have to deal uh, with him. So we'll see what happens there. Right, let's just round things up, just look at some of the other market moves around the world of politics. Uh, there's been a few to talk about. Um, Joe Biden, we haven't talked about the US very much so far. What's happening with his prospects of re-election? Yeah, so it's been really interesting over the last couple of months um, since the Roe versus Wade decision that Republicans will probably be ruining that, ruin yeah. that, uh, that decision for a long time coming. Um, the Democrats have been moving up in the, in the midterm polls, and there's now even some suggestion that they could hold the House as well as the Senate. Um, and Joe Biden's approval ratings have just been going going straight up. Um, they, had, they had been very low, but they are making making a recovery now. Um, and his prospect of, of re-election have risen. So they've gone from 10% to 15% over the last six weeks, which still feels kind of low to me. Um, and I, I know Biden's very old, but he claims that he's going to run again. Um, and if he, if he runs again, you, even if it's just 50-50 chance of him being re-elected, 15% is pretty low. Yeah, I mean, age is a fact here, isn't it? Yeah. And just his, his overall condition. Because if this was sort of 2008 Joe Biden, mm. um, he'd be you know heavy odds on to be the nominee, probably trading around evens to be president. And now he's sort of six to one-ish. Probably, I don't know, probably still worth a small bet. Let's just go uh, a bit further south here because we've got a Brazilian presidential election taking place next month. Now... From a betting point of view, in contrast to Sweden, where, let's be honest, there hasn't been an enormous amount of money traded on this, on you know, any betting platforms you care to look at, there are millions and millions and millions of pounds and dollars uh, being staked on the Brazilian presidential election, not least in Brazil itself. I was talking to a uh, someone else who's work, involved in the world of political betting. Their company has some uh, customers in Brazil, and he says the amounts of money being staked on this are enormous. And disproportionately, the Brazilian money is going on Bolsonaro to get re-elected, which, if you look to the polls, you'd think would be very, very unlikely. But what are the odds saying on a Lula, Lula comeback? Yes, so Lula has gone from 59% to 70% in the last week, which is quite a big, a big spike. Um, but, I mean, he's been ahead in the polls for a very long time. And I think this is one of those cases where you can kind of take advantage of the seeming right-wing bias in, in the betting markets and... Yeah, it seems kind of crazy. I feel it's a bit sort of immodest to say, look, look, us guys here in London know better than, you know, Brazilian people willing to stick their money down what's going to happen here. But if you were just looking at modelling it based on the polls right now, 
he's like 10 points ahead, let's say. There's only a few weeks left. It's a completely polarised choice. You wouldn't think many people are going to be changing their minds. I mean, I would have thought his price, real price, should have been something like 1.1, and yet he's trading way, way bigger than that. Um, lastly, let's just go back to the UK. Uh, you talked about your tip for the next Tory leader. I have had a couple of darts on this um, this long-term market here. I have back your guy. Uh, but I've also had a small bet on James Cleverly, um, now Foreign Secretary, matched as low as 10 on Smarkets. Uh, can still get my 33s elsewhere. Does that seem like a fair price to you? Yeah, like I, I'm the same as you. I back James Cleverly on a different platform, let's say. At, uh, <laughs> there are others, yeah. Um, I think that's that's a really good bet. I think if you look at, if you wanted to be Tory leader in, in a few years' time and you had to get one of the big jobs, you probably want Foreign Secretary. Chancellor, you've got a lot of economic problems coming up and you probably wouldn't want to be in that job. And Home Secretary, again, Pretty Patel was very unpopular. It's probably not very, um, it's a bit of a thankless. Yeah, thing. it used to be a sort of graveyard, didn't it? Because there was a lot of turnover of Home Secretaries yeah. at, at one point, especially during the Labour years. Um, it's a bit more stable because Theresa May stayed on for quite a long time and Patel had a quite, a, quite a decent run there. Um, yeah, cleverly for me, he's quite an engaging character. He's got quite a good backstory. Um, and as you say, Foreign Secretary gets a stride around the world, uh, standing up to Putin, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's only going to be probably good for him, I think, in the long run. Right. Thanks so much, Patrick. And thanks for tuning in this episode. As I said, next week, we have a very special guest, Kieran Pedley from Ipsos Mori, to talk all things polling. But until then, thanks very much for joining us and see you next week. If you enjoyed this podcast and you want to hear more from us, there's a variety of ways you can stay in touch. You can follow us on Twitter at Smarkets Poll, at Smarkets P-O-L, or you can just follow the main Smarkets account, which is at Smarkets. Or you can subscribe on YouTube, where I'm sure many of you are watching right now. If you have any questions for us ahead of next week's episode, we will have Kieran Pedley from Ipsos Mori on the show. So if you have any questions for Kieran as well, feel free to send them to us on Twitter via a DM or just tweet us, or you can email us at politics at See you next week.